Hello, this is Holly Sanders, and I'd like to welcome you to your first lesson for our ALHS 1011 Anatomy and Physiology course. In this first lesson, we're going to be covering an orientation of the human body, which correlates to Chapter 1 from your Marib's Essentials of Anatomy and Physiology textbook. And please remember that the best way to prepare for each one of these units is to follow the outline, which I'm going to pull up on the screen here. And you can print this from Angel. And basically, it's going to go through uh, in the same way that we're going to go through presentation together here. And it's uh, essential that you understand this information rather than what's presented in the book, because this is following the curriculum for the course, whereas the book may have more or less information at different points throughout the semester. So go ahead and pull this up and print it off so as we go through it you can start making notes. I also suggest when you get through with each one of these presentations that you turn these outline notes into flashcards or study cards and this will really help you prepare for the test especially uh, with the amount of memorization required for this course. Okay so let's go ahead and get started. First of all, anatomy is the study of the structure and shape of the body and its parts. And this is where all that memorization comes in, where you have to learn the bones and the muscles and the parts of the brain and the parts of the heart and any of the structure of the body. But then, and to understand how it works or functions, you have to understand the physiology. So again, physiology is the study of how the body and its parts work or function. So really, you can't have physiology without anatomy. You can't have life without physiology because the structure without the function uh, would not be a living being any longer. So when we start looking at the anatomy, we're going to break it into two sections. The first is what we call gross anatomy, which are large structures that we can observe with the eye, such as the muscles or the bones, and things that uh, most people think of when they think of studying anatomy. However, there is an equally important part, which is microscopic anatomy. And this has to do with, you know, the very small su structures such as cells or even tissues that you can only view through a microscope. And this is usually the point when students start getting uncomfortable because it's uh, often more challenging to learn things that you can't easily see. But it is very important that we start with the microscopic anatomy because essentially all we are are beings made up of billions and billions of cells. And so this is where we get into our structural level of organization. So if you think about us as an entire organism and you start breaking us down into our essential parts, we are always start with our most basic level of structural organization at the chemical level. Basically, chemicals combine and atoms combine to form molecules. And as these structures become more and more advanced, they will then turn into cells. So chemical level turns into the cellular level. And then as you get groups of cells together, this will produce a tissue. So the third level would be the tissue level. And then when you combine multiple types of tissues, for instance, if you're looking on the screen with me, and this is actually a blood vessel, you'll see there's connective tissue, smooth muscle tissue, and then on the inside something called epithelial tissue that we'll get into uh, details about later. But as you can see, these are three different types of tissues. When you have more than one tissue, this makes up an organ. So if you're looking at this blood vessel, you'll see that this is an organ. And many of you probably haven't thought of a blood vessel being an organ, but we're going to get into more detail with that as well. And so then when you start combining multiple organs that work together within a system, you get to the organ system level. So if you're looking at this diagram out here, you can see all the blood vessels, and then here in the middle is the heart. So this together would be the cardiovascular system. And then when you add up all the different organ systems, you will arrive at the organism. So in review again, the six levels starting from the most basic would be chemicals, and chemicals combine to produce cells. This is a smooth muscle cell that you're looking at. Cells combine to produce tissues. When you have multiple tissues combined together, that produces an organ. When you have multiple organs working together, this produces an organ system. And then finally, the multiple organ systems come together to produce the organism. 
I will make a note that this is uh, important that you learn because basically the way that our course is going to work is in this order. So I'm going to back up for just a second and explain that this is, of course, the introduction uh, chapter and uh, associated lecture. But from there, our chapter two and next lecture is going to be on, chemi on chemistry or talk about some of the chemicals. And then as you can probably guess, from there we're going to go to cells, then tissues, until finally we start getting into the organs and we'll break them down through the different organ systems. Starting with our integumentary system. And this may be a term many of you are not familiar with, but it's basically our external body covering or our skin. After that, we'll look into the muscular and skeletal system. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with our bones and our muscles. Next, we'll do the nervous system. I do want to take time to point out that the nervous system is responsible for our fast-acting control system. And we're going to spend a lot of time looking into how the nervous system helps us respond to our internal and external environments and adjust um, necessarily to keep ourselves healthy. Next would be the endocrine system, and this may be a system many of you are unfamiliar with as well, but basically it's our hormones and how the hormones regulate uh, the needs of our body. So the nervous system and the endocrine system work together to create our natural response mechanisms to our internal and external environments. The nervous system is a super fast acting control system or uh, responder, whereas the endocrine system is slow. So go ahead and make a note of this, that the endocrine and nervous system work together um, to help regulate the needs of our body. From there, we'll go into the cardiovascular system. Then we'll go into the lymphatic system. And basically, the function of the lymphatic system is uh, during some transfer between uh, our blood and our cells, there is always some fluid that's lost out between the cells or the blood uh, vessels, and the lymphatic system returns this extra fluid uh, back to where it should go within um, our blood. It also helps with our immunity and our defense mechanisms. So lymphatics are really exciting, complicated system that we'll take a look at. And then we'll go into the respiratory system and the digestive system. The urinary system, which is basically how uh, our kidneys work to maintain our acid-base balance um, within our body. And then finally, we'll end up this semester with the reproductive system. So why are you taking this course? All of you are going into healthcare fields in which you're going to help patients try to maintain their best quality of health in life. But in order to do this, we need to consider how anatomy and physiology affect ourselves first and then our patients. And just to get to the most essential portion of this, we need to understand how we maintain life. And there's eight necessary life functions that we need to take a look at and always keep in mind as we're working through this course and then working in our program areas um, in the way that all of these issues are going to affect our patients. First of all, we have to be able to maintain boundaries. There are two ways I want you to think of this. Now, the most obvious boundary would be our tegumentary system or our skin, which of course keeps our insides on the inside and outside things such as um, bacteria and, and different harmful agents out. But also, if you go down to our more simple level of organization, and if you remember those levels of organization, it's chemistry, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and then finally the organisms, each cell has to have its own cell membrane. So if you think about us being nothing but a bag of cells, every single one of our cells have skin. So both of these boundaries need to be maintained. And just as if someone was lacerated or had an incision made into their skin, there would of course be blood and depending on the depth of the injury, expose the inside of our body, the cell membrane is the exact same way. So if a cell membrane is ripped or torn or lacerated, then again the contents of the cell would fall out. And since we are nothing but cells, um, this, if this happened to enough of them, then it would definitely uh, be a risk of life. Next would be our ability to move. I mean, this of course does 
create some physical movement from our muscles and our musculoskeletal system. But if you think about it, there are plenty of people who are living very successful, full lives that do not have full movement, whether they're a quadriplegic or have some nervous damage. So if you think about it, that may not be a necessary life function, but if, if you start thinking about the movement of substances through our bodies, such as blood through our blood vessels or um, food as it moves through our digestive tract, this movement is necessary for life. The next would be our ability to sense the need to change and to be able to react, react to this, which we call responsiveness. This is not responsiveness such as um, being able to physically speak or respond to someone. This is our ability, if our blood sugar gets too high, that we can bring it back to a normal level. Or if it gets too low, that it can be raised um, somewhere where our brain can continue to function. Or if our body temperature starts to rise, how we will sweat to cool ourselves off. Or even vice versa, if we start to get too cold, how we'll start to shiver or have chill bumps to try to warm ourselves back up. This ability to uh, have responsiveness, again, comes from our nervous system, which is fast acting, or our endocrine system, which is slow acting, and is absolutely necessary for life function. The next three have to do with how we get energy so our cells can continue to function. The first ability would be to be able to digest or break down and absorb nutrients. Next would be to take these nutrients and be able to produce energy. This is the term metabolism. So just because a person is able to digest or absorb doesn't mean that they are also going to be able to make energy. So this is also essential. And then finally, that we can excrete or eliminate waste um, from these metabolic reactions. Now all three of these necessary life functions do come from our digestive system. Uh, but each are independently important, and we'll look at these in detail uh, throughout the course. Number seven would be our ability to reproduce. Now, of course, this is producing future generations, which is important for the species, but not every human has to reproduce to maintain life. This is where I have to remind you that the levels of structural organization are absolutely important and that we are nothing but our chemicals that make up cells. Our cells have to be able to reproduce. And finally, along the same lines, the ability for our cells and for our tissues to grow. So it, we need to be able to increase our cell size and number of cells. Homeostasis is basically the maintenance of this stable internal environment. So if you imagine that you're standing and you're balancing um, and you start to fall one way, it's what you do to come back to balance. So it's how you counteract something that's throwing you off balance. And this is happening throughout our bodies all the time. As you're sitting here right now doing this presentation, there are homeostatic responses that are happening from moment to moment just to keep you healthy. So again, homeostasis is necessary for normal body functioning and to sustain life. And in fact, a homeostatic imbalance is what we would call a pathology or disease. So basically, pathology, which is one of the medical terms for disease, is simply when homeostasis is not achieved. And whether it's out of whack for a little while and it's going to come back um, during that time, there's a disease state or even... Um, if it was going to require some intervention such as medicine uh, to bring it back. So basically as we struggle to maintain homeostasis and therefore health, our two main systems that are helping to recognize and control our homeostatic feedback are our nervous system and our endocrine system. And just to remind you, the nervous system is our fast response system, whereas our endocrine system is our slow response system. And basically how it works, and there's a receptor that is picking up that there is a homeostatic imbalance at hand. And when the receptor figures this out, it's going to send this information to our control center, generally our brain or our spinal cord, where we figure out what we need to do. In that case, whatever it is that we need to do to correct the homeostatic imbalance would be our effector. So as we break down homeostasis, there are two main feedback mechanisms. And you're going to spend a little time working on these because it may take a little bit of deeper thought to get these down. But the first one is simply called negative feedback mechanism. Now it's really important that you note that just because there's the word negative doesn't mean that it is a bad thing. In fact, 
negative feedback mechanisms um, control the homeostasis or health of most all of our regular body systems and body functions. If for some reason we are getting out of homeostasis, it is a negative feedback mechanism that will bring it back into homeostasis. For example, if your body temperature raises beyond its normal range of about 98.6, you'll begin to sweat to cool off the body and bring that back into homeostatic range. This would be a negative feedback mechanism by lowering your body temperature. But if you get cold and your body temperature begins to drop, you will start to shiver and you'll also get some chill bumps and this is going to help raise your body temperature. Although it's going higher, this is still referred to as negative feedback mechanism or a negative feedback response. Again, negative feedback is simply when your body um, adjusts to bring you back into homeostasis. And there are several, several examples. There are more given in the book. You can Google many of them. But I'm going to stop with this example because one of the things you're going to do in effort to learn this unit is you're going to come up with your own negative feedback mechanism examples so you can put some more deep thought into this. There is also something called a positive feedback mechanism. This is unique in that to maintain homeostasis the stimulus is just going to increase and increase and increase and basically continue further. And this is very rare within the body. Like I pointed out, most of our responses are negative feedback in nature, but there are two familiar ones. The first one being blood clotting. Now, if you imagine that you cut your finger and your blood was starting to clot, you wouldn't want that to stop before it had completely shut off that, that loss of blood and the, that severed blood vessel, which by the way, a blood vessel is an organ, if you recall, which is made up of tissue which are made up of cells. So if you think about a knife cutting through your skin and cutting through your blood vessel, then you can imagine those cell walls being divided, and that would be the boundaries that we were talking about earlier. But as that blood continues to clot, uh, this is a positive feedback mechanism, which is going to continue the clotting process further and further and further and not turn off, which is a very good thing for our homeostasis. Another example would be labor. When a woman goes into labor, there is a hormone, and remember hormones come from the endocrine system, which is our slow response system. A hormone is released, which tells the uterus to contract. And as any mothers out there know, or anyone who uh, knows about or has watched the process of uh, childbirth, um, once that hormone hits the uterus, contractions start and they do not stop until that child is born. This is also a positive feedback mechanism that it just continues to increase. The cervix gets uh, more and more open and the uterus starts to contract more and more until the child is born. Now if you think about the mother and her best health, having that baby at that point will provide her best homeostasis. So if you think about it, the positive feedback response of increasing this variable of, of um, uterine contractions further and further and further will eventually bring the mother back into her best homeostatic states. So what is healthcare? What are we doing for our patients? I just want to leave you with this thought before you go off to work on your assignment that I'm going to show you on Edmodo. Basically, as a healthcare provider, we are working on being someone's homeostatic mechanism when they cannot do it for themselves. That's what medicine is. If you have um, a bacterial infection, your body is not able to fight off that bacteria, so it can't have a negative feedback response. So if you take an antibacterial medication, then that is the negative feedback you can't do for yourself. And this is the same for many things. Um, like I said, I don't want to give too many examples right now because I want all of you to have the ability to critically think about um, some of these concepts. But if you think about a diabetic whose blood sugar is uncontrolled, their pancreas is not releasing insulin, which would reduce blood sugar. So in that case, healthcare is giving that patient insulin from the outside to create that negative feedback mechanism. So just consider that and consider your future program and how you're going to be uh, working for and on and affecting patients and how this is going to impact your everyday life. While you're thinking about that, I'm going to direct you to an assignment which 
I will have posted on Edmodo. And it's called the homeostatic, homeostasis written assignment. And basically, your challenge is to do three things. First, I want you to define homeostasis and give an example using both a positive and a negative feedback mechanism. You now, this example, um, there are just there are only a couple of positive examples as we talked about, but the negative feedback um, mechanism there is just tons and tons that are happening within our bodies at all times. So I want you just to stretch your mind and, and see what you can come up with. Now on this assignment, uh, you will have two opportunities if you turn this in by the due date. Um, and I will give you some feedback and let you try again. So go ahead and go for it. Go out on a limb and uh, see how you can challenge yourself here. And then for the second part, I want you to give a healthcare example of a pathology created from a patient experiencing a homeostatic imbalance. And also, try to make this an example relevant to your program of study. So, I am a surgical technologist, and something relevant to me would be a patient with appendicitis. Their appendix is uh, infected, and then it's inflamed, and it's causing them trouble. So, as part of the surgical team, I would go in and assist with the removal of the appendix, which would be a negative feedback mechanism. We're removing that appendix so that this patient can go back to homeostatic balance. So I want you to think about what you're going into and how a situation may affect your patients. If you're in the business uh, side of healthcare, then just imagine something you'd see in a chart or you know a patient file that you may come across. So any anything that you can think of is fair game here. Again, um, I want you to just take some time to think about this um, and I will give you some feedback. And finally, I want you to concentrate on your um, writing quality and make an excellent effort uh, for these last 10 points. Um, and again, if you do make the effort and give it your best shot and take the time to proofread and, and work on your writing quality, you will have a second opportunity uh, to turn in your assignment for more points. So again, this is more for you to, to learn and, and work with these concepts rather than a right or wrong situation. So I really hope that you enjoy this. And... Uh, this will wrap up this session. We will finish chapter one in the next section. Have a great day.